name is Nicky Aria Singer. I lead blockchain partnerships at Chainlink Labs. Uh, as many of you may know, Chainlink is a blockchain agnostic network. So we're integrated with 14 different blockchains and rollups. As we look to expand that number, one of the key inputs is what do users want and what's driving users to particular uh, chains and rollups. So two pieces of user feedback that we've heard. One is users want faster transaction speeds. Two is they want improved capital efficiency. And those are two of the key reasons that we are big believers and supporters of ZK rollups as a category of rollups that's emerging. And within ZK rollups, Starknet is undoubtedly one of the leaders. And as you know, we've been working with Starkware for quite some time, we've been very impressed by their technical prowess and also their willingness to collaborate with Chainlink. Um, so you'll hear much more about the expanding partnership between Starkware and Chainlink uh, in the coming months. But for now, please join me in welcoming Gal Ron to talk to us a little bit about the latest on StarkNet. Gal. All right, thanks, Nikki, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so my name is Gal. I'm a product manager at Starkware. Uh, and I'm going to uh, talk with you today about scale. So over the past four years uh, at Starkware, we've been building systems that scale blockchain. Last year, we released StarkNet, uh, which is a ZK rollup on top of Ethereum that significantly uh, increases the scale of Ethereum. Uh, and usually in this kind of talks, we talk about how we use Starks. But today, I wanted to talk about why do we need scale for blockchain uh, from the first place. So if there's one purpose for the Stark, it would be to, I think, ignite your imagination to think about what are some new use cases that you or other blockchain developers can build with a network that has cheap and fast transactions that is as secure as the base layer Ethereum. So we're going to start with talking about some of the limitations of L1 chains today. Uh, and then we're going to shift to talking about the, um, uh, the way layer 2 sort of revolutionizes what app developers can do with blockchain. And I'm going to conclude with some uh, insight and news about the roadmap of StarkNet and the StarkNet ecosystem. OK, so let's start with uh, thinking about some of the limits of L1 chains today. And I think that there's a, there's a paradox here, because blockchain has been around for 14 years now. But it's still much slower and more expensive than many conventional um, traditional systems like banks that are able to process many, many thousands of transactions every second. So ask myself, why is that? Why do we have this difference? And I think that the reason lies in the difference in trust model. Right? So in centralized systems, like banks or uh, uh, credit card payment systems, we have a central entity that takes care of all of our um, data and finance and, and computation. And this is obviously a very efficient model, because uh, every transaction is executed only once. But the trade-off that we're making here is that we are uh, trading um, scalability for inclusivity. We have to trust a central uh, entity. Uh, with all our data. Blockchain works a bit differently in what we call an inclusive accountability model. So um, in blockchain, we basically invite everyone to uh, take part in the operation of the network, right? To bring their laptop or, or even their smartphone and to become auditors or operators in the system. And this is a beautiful model, but the drawback here is that not everyone uh, has a giant computer, so we need to limit the throughput of the chain in order to allow even the smallest player to participate as operators. Uh, and here, we're trade, uh, trading off. We're making the opposite trade off. We are trading off scalability for inc inclusivity. We're limiting the throughput of the system to allow smaller players to participate. All right, so uh, Ethereum is definitely one of those chains where the throughput is limited. And the fact that the throughput is limited makes transactions quite costly, which requires app developers to operate in a very restricted environment. So we see that developers on Ethereum and also many other layer one chains are um, constantly thinking about how should they optimize their applications and to some extent even distort their logic of their apps just in order to be able to operate within those constraints. Um, and, and we see this across the board in many uh, areas of blockchain development. In DeFi, for example, the whole concept of AMM, right, like Uniswap or SushiSwap, sushi is basically a low gas approximation of an order book. In uh, the, the field of oracles, updates are quite expensive, so developers have to uh, deal with low frequency updates and limited data sets. 
in, in the area of DAOs, most DAOs actually do not bring their voting on chain because it's quite uh, costly. And we can uh, continue with this list on and on. So I think that for all of those reasons, the, the task of uh, scaling blockchain is uh, it's, it's kind of obvious why it's quite deserving. And the question here is how do we uh, create a chain that has both inclusive accountability, where everyone can participate, but uh, is scalable? So we want to keep a high throughput without excluding anyone from participating in the operation of the system. So let's think about a first attempt, um, which is basically asking everyone to have larger computers, more disk space, better internet connection. And that's the direction that a lot of uh, other layer ones are taking. Uh, and this is great. Like, that's a really good way to increase throughput. But the problem is that not everyone is going to be able to keep updating their systems over and over. So over time, we start excluding smaller players from participating in the operation of the network. And we sort of regress back to the centralized model where we have a small set of large computers taking care of the operation. Um, OK, so the, the approach that we've been um, sort of pi pioneering at Starkware for the past four years and is now embraced by some, uh, some other uh, projects is scaling through the use of cryptographic validity proofs, which basically means trusting, uh, trusting math instead of trusting humans. So in this model, we have um, uh, one or a few very large computers that process all transactions. But the thing is that we don't need to trust anything about those computers. They can really be as, as evil and as malicious as it gets. We don't, we don't make any trust assumption on their hardware or their software. And the, the reason that we can do this is that those computers, along their processing of the transactions, they output uh, a cryptographic proof that attests for the validity of their execution. That's what we have on the one side. And on the other side, we have um, many, many small computers that verify the validity of those proofs. And verifying uh, the validity of a proof is a very simple task. Like even with the smartphone that you have in your pocket, you can very easily validate a proof that attests for the processing of many, many thousands of transactions. So on the one hand, we have um, quite a computationally intensive process of generating a proof, which is uh, quite exclusive for that reason. And on the other hand, we have the process of verifying the proof, which is very simple and, and lean and can be done by anyone, so it's very, very inclusive. And that's how we get both scalability and inclusive accountability. And that was also a 60, minute, 60 second or 90 second um, intro to how Stark proofs work and to how Stark networks. All right, so what do we, what do we achieve with a system like StarkNet? First, we achieve scale in the form of speed, right? So on Ethereum, we have a TPS that uh, like the number of transactions per second fluctuates around, let's say, between 10 to maybe 25 transactions. Um, but on a system like StarkNet, the number is much, much higher than that. And with concepts like fractile scaling that we introduced earlier this year, the TPS of the system is pretty much uncapped. That's uh, one benefit. Another flavor of scalability is uh, using complex logic, complex transactions um, that I'm going to touch, I'm gonna touch uh, more on in a second. Basically, imagine, imagine that you could interact with a smart contract that has 100,000 line, lines of code instead of 100 lines of code and still do it cheaply and uh, quickly. And the last benefit is security. We, because we commit all our proofs to Ethereum, the base layer, we get the same security as, as Ethereum. And you might have heard the term Cairo mentioned in the context of StarkNet. So Cairo is the programming language that we use for writing smart contracts, which execution we later prove with Stark proofs. OK, so, so all those benefits unlock quite a lot of uh, new use cases for blockchain developers. And I want to touch on some of them right now. So since we're uh, at the conference uh, by Chainlink, I think it would be appropriate to start with some examples from the world of oracles. And when I think about the um, the, the way layer two technology revolutionizes oracles, I think about three things. One is the frequency of updates. Two is uh, the concept of computational feeds. And three is the diversity of data sets. So in terms of uh, frequency, when Oracle updates, when transactions are much cheaper, oracles can update much more frequently. The data is always a lot more fresh. And this is fundamental for reducing risk in DeFi apps. 
computational feed is the concept of uh, instead of sending price feeds as oracles, sending complex functions of those price feeds. So if you think about um, uh, constructs like risk or yield or volatility, these are functions of price feeds. And those components are really fundamental for a lot of traditional, fin traditional applications in uh, finance. And they now become available on systems like StarkNet. And the third thing is the diversity of data sets. Again, when you have very cheap transactions, each app can kind of pull the unique data that it needs as an oracle. So we can break out of the scheme of sending only price feeds to sending weather data, gaming data, sports data, and, and so on. Another area that is uh, disrupted by layer twos is DeFi. And we have quite a vibrant DeFi ecosystem on StarkNet. Um, and uh, those are some of the applications that we see those DeFi apps implementing uh, in, in Cairo. So we have an app um, implementing an order book uh, that's fully on-chain. We have an app that implemented cross-margin cross trading on-chain, which basically means using the same collateral for multiple DeFi positions. We have uh, an implementation of DeFi pooling, which is the concept of pulling a, a bunch of uh, DeFi users together into a single layer one, uh, layer one transaction in order to reduce the cost of gas they're using. OK, so we, we touched on oracles and, and DeFi, but uh, there are many, many uh, more fields in blockchain that are disrupted by the scale that layer twos bring to Ethereum. Um, and here are some examples. We have apps uh, bringing very complex logic on chain, like gaming, uh, gaming engines, graphics engines. We recently had uh, a very uh, cool, in my opinion, POC of uh, a neural network brought on, implemented in Cairo and brought on chain. Um, we have a partnership with Snapshot in a project called Snapshot X that allows DAOs to bring their, uh, their, their voting fully on chain on StarkNet. And again, these are just some examples. All right, so before we conclude, I just want to um, say a couple of words about the roadmap ahead for, for StarkNet. So we've been on mainnet since last November. Um, so we're going to celebrate our first birthday soon, which is, uh, I think, quite a lot in, in blockchain years. And today we have 200,000 accounts deployed on mainnet, 50,000 contracts. And I think that the upcoming months are going to be quite exciting for the StarkNet ecosystem. Uh, we've recently announced the launch of the StarkNet Foundation that is set to take form soon. And in a matter of, uh, of weeks, we're going to um, publish a new version of Cairo. We call it Cairo 1.0. Uh, that is a lot more developer friendly. It really looks uh, a lot more like um, um, Rust than uh, Assembly, which is kind of like how Cairo looks today. Um, and all, all, of, all of those milestones are just steps along the path of fully decentralizing StarkNet. And that's what we're building for. And I expect that in the upcoming year, we're going to have um, uh, more milestones towards that direction. OK, so if uh, you're considering exploring uh, building on StarkNet, I think that this is a good time to, to start. And I invite you to uh, reach out to me or anyone else from the team to, uh, um, to get you started. Um, I hope that uh, this uh, talk really uh, uh, created some inspiration for um, new and innovative things that you can bring on chain on systems like StarkNet. And with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, thank you very much.